Today I want to talk about hill climbing, which is a, a basic form of search, which is a basic thing that we use computers for. Uh, this is part of the class that we're working on in computational thinking and programming. So search is basically the idea of trial and error. Do something, see if it works. If not, do something else until you find whatever works. Once you've found whatever works, you can kind of ignore all of the errors and just go straight to the solution in the future so things are better. People used to say that computers can't do anything new, computers can't create anything, because they can only do what you programmed into them. And that's true, but we can program them to search so that they may well, in fact, by trying a bunch of combinations and seeing which ones work according to however we defined working for them, they may well, and do regularly, find combinations of parameters that produce values that we ourselves didn't know. Search creates knowledge, and that's the reason why it's worth understanding something about search in general, search in computers, search in, in people. So. The way we look at search it has two basic parts. It has the problem space, which is the thing that you are searching, and then it has a searcher, which is actually a method of moving through the problem space. So a problem space, for our purposes, is basically a function. You have some unknown function, you're giving it a bunch of inputs, and you get back a number, an evaluation, a score. And your job as a searcher is to find the combination of inputs that will produce the best score. And if not the best score, maybe some good enough score. Depends on the problem. So the way we characterize the problem spaces is number one in terms of how many inputs to the function are there. Is there just one function, one parameter that you can vary to the function? That would be a one-dimensional search space. Are there two dimensions that you can, three, four, more dimensions that you can vary? That's the dimensionality. On each dimension, then there's the question of how many different values might you want to consider. Some things like, you know, price or something might be essentially continuous or very fine-grained, penny more, a penny less. Other dimensions like, you know, red or green, chili, uh, are more discrete. There's only a couple of choices. So that goes to the granularity of the space. And finally, there's the ruggedness that if you've got some set of parameters, like I'm willing to pay 59 cents for some green chili, and you say, well, would you pay 60 cents? Would you pay 59 cents for red? You've got changing variations. How much is that going to change the answer? So if you can make small changes in the parameters and usually get small changes in the answer, that's a smooth problem space, problem space, a smooth landscape. If, on the other hand, making small changes in the parameters causes huge changes, cliffs and peaks in the function values that come back, that's a very rugged landscape. Smooth landscapes are going to tend to be easier to search. Rugged landscapes are going to be harder. Okay, how are we going to search it? The basic idea of search, or the basic idea of hill climbing, is this. You start with some set of inputs, whatever it's going to be, however many dimensions the, input, the function needs, you pick values for all of them, and then you try to tweak it, change one dimension, one unit, up, down, up, or down, up, or down, and look to see if you can find an improvement. So that's what makes it climbing a hill. It's as if you've got a guy who's sitting somewhere in space and he's looking all around him and saying, well, that one's uphill, so I'll go there and then I'll look all around it again. Well, that's uphill and so on. So hill climbing is an example of what's called a weak method. Weak meaning it makes very few assumptions about the problem space. If we knew certain things about the problem space, if we knew like the output was linearly related to the inputs, whatever that means, we could do much better. We could come up with very clever solution techniques that would just essentially go right to the answer or very quickly find the best answer. But a weak method doesn't make any assumptions. It doesn't assume that the landscape is smooth, for example. It might be rugged. So a weak method is something that we can apply to almost anything. That's good. The flip side of the weak method is it doesn't actually guarantee to work. We'll see that in a second. So 
in order to do this idea of saying, here I am, that's got this score, here's a bunch of variations, it has to, the searcher has to evaluate the function at all those neighboring spots. And those evaluations take some work. Uh, it might be, you know, it depends what the function is. So typically the cost of searching is going to be dominated by the cost of doing these evaluations of different uh, varieties. I mean, if evaluation costs were zero, well, we could just try all possible combinations. Pick the best. But evaluation costs are not zero. It always takes at least a little bit of time and, you know, in some cases, you may have to actually like build models or do a physical experiment to determine how good a combination of inputs are. The evaluation costs could be very expensive. And then finally, we have to have a stopping criteria, an idea of when we're going to give up. Do we know that the it's possible to reach a value of 100, so we're trying to find that? Are we just going to search for two days and then take the best one we've got? What's our rule? Okay, that's search. Let's look at some examples. Uh, um, all right, here is a one-dimensional problem. So now there's just a varying the x, and you get a height back, and the job is to find the highest height. And here we've got a guy, he's called the steepest ascent hill climber, and in fact, he's just done the job for us. So if we start him over, uh, all right, so he was stuck in some random position. If we do one evaluation, he didn't move. Now he did. One, one. Why is he only moving every other evaluation? Because he's got to look to his right, look to his left, evaluate both of those, and decide which one is the best. They both might be uphill, in which case he wants to take the one that's more uphill. Steepest ascent. So, in fact, he's making a move every other uh, uh, evaluation here. And this works great. <sighs> the flip side of making such good progress is that it's easy to mess up the steepest ascent hill climber. So if we put a few little uh, hooks or little nasty spots, and now we try to let this guy go, he climbs, he gets stuck on this little teeny peak. This little teeny peak is what's called a local maximum. Local meaning every possibility one step away from where he is is worse or no better. So it just sits there. But it's not also the global maximum. So the global maximum in this case is our peak up here. It's the best possible function value that we would like to get if we could over all possible values of the function. Here, so Here's a little thing where people get the quiz question wrong, that, you know, this point up here, well, um, there, I stuck him up there. Is that guy at a local maximum? Well, people would say, no, he's at the global maximum, but that's the trick. The global maximum is also a local maximum. Local maximum meaning all the neighbors are worse or no better. That's true. Left, right, both worse. It's a local maximum and the global maximum. All right. So, but this is a problem, let's let this just go, that most of the time now, if we start the steepest descent guy in a random place, uh, he got it there, he's not actually going to get to the global maximum if there are these little irregularities. And we can do better than this if we admit that maybe being absolutely strict but only going up is too strict. Maybe if we were willing to go down a little bit, we could then go up much further. And that's what stochastic hill climbing does. Let's start them both again. All right. So stochastic hill climbing, you know, looks kind of stupid because it's going down, it's going up. But the virtue of it is, is it blows right through those little barbs in the landscape that catch the steepest ascent hill climber. It's totally willing to go down and then, whoa, look at this. There's another place that it can go up. The flip side of that is this thing doesn't ever seem to stop. It doesn't. It doesn't know that that spot in the middle is the global maximum. As far as it's concerned, you know, there could be something else further away that's even better. There's sort of a combination of both of these guys called simulated annealing 
that starts out, and without going into the details, starts out being very random, willing to go up and down and up and down. But it's got this temperature, this parameter called T, which stands for temperature. And the temperature governs how willing it is to be crazy and random. When the temperature is high, it's very random. As the temperature gets lower, it gets more and more focused on improvements. So here the temperature is down to 16, 15, 14. It's still pretty random at the moment, but it's starting to spend more and more and more time heading up. And the idea is, if we're lucky, it'll end up getting to the global maximum before the temperature gets so low that essentially it turns into the steepest ascent hill climber and will never go down again. So we're doing pretty well here. Uh, um, yeah, it looks like annealing is going to kind of lock in on the maximum in this case. Now, this is only one kind of landscape. There are many more sort of uh, rugged landscapes uh, like this. Uh, that's a sort of weird one. I don't really know what that means. Uh, um, so, well, steep ascent did good there. Well, that's because we didn't have enough. Uh, um, you know, who knows what. Now we've got sort of big, broad areas where you'd have to go downhill a whole bunch of times. Anything you want. Okay. But this is just an example. It's a one-dimensional function. And if you're thinking, these guys all look pretty stupid. Well, you're right. I mean, in this particular case, there's only actually a hundred different possible inputs to the function, because I divided it up that way. Uh, so uh, one to the left, one to the right from zero to 99. It's really easy just to try them all, and then you'll know the maximum for sure. But that's because we've just picked a simple example. Let's look at another one. Here's a two-dimensional example where now we have an X and a Y and we get back a grayscale where white is good and black is bad in this particular case. Uh, uh, we'll switch that later. And all right, and, and so here's the other thing. Now, steepest ascent, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now steepest ascent has to do four evaluations before deciding where to go because it goes up, down on X, up, down on Y before finding the best one. But once again, uh, it finds the maximum in this unimodal function, a function that only has one peak uh, um, without a problem. And the same way uh, if we sort of like carve out a moat around this thing. Now this is no longer a, uh, let's close it off there, no longer a multi, uh, a unimodal function, it's a multimodal function. And in fact, uh, it has many local maxima and usually steepest ascent is going to get screwed and hung up along the edge of the moat. Oh, that time it managed to get in. Okay. And the same thing, stochastic uh, hill climbing or annealing will avoid that problem. Uh, uh, these small problems, these small little dips, they'll just sort of blow through uh, and in the le very likely get the uh, get to the maximum in the end, even though it's got some traps along the way. But still, this is now something like, um, this I think might be 64 by 64. That's still enough that we could really just try every single spot. And, you know, at this point, we really might want to because, you know, who knows? If we're being a weak method, you know, we could have a little secret crystal city off in the corner here that's, like, super great. And if Searcher never, ever got there, never even evaluated anything in that corner, he would have no way of knowing that. But since we only have a small number, two dimensions, uh, uh, there's a lot that we don't see as far as really what makes search challenging. So for a final example, let's look at this. What the heck is this? This is a picture, uh, uh, but it's been hidden. There's a secret picture in there, and then there's a bunch of masks that have been laid on top of it. That Each mask flips a bunch of bits in the picture. And there are 64 masks and some subset of those have to be turned on to reveal the hidden picture. And so what we have down here at the bottom, this white bar, is a bit vector, 64 bits in a row, that each one controls one of those masks. So if I turn this guy on, 
Uh, well, in this case, if I turn that guy on, that makes the score worse. Ah, that guy next to him, if I turn him on, it makes the score better. It goes from 274 to 277, and so on. So I can flip all of these bits one at a time, or whatever I want to do, to try to find a better score. Okay, and let's let the uh, steepest ascent guy see now in this case the steepest ascent guy has to do 64 evaluations just to move one step Let's speed him up one step one step okay so well all right but the score is going up 344 uh, uh, 357 and so on just making progress unfortunately uh, 373 What's going to happen here? Still finding some improvement. Oh, we're doing good. Uh, um, now, usually the way I've designed this thing, steepest ascent eventually gets screwed up. Eventually it ends up getting into some local peak where it tries turning off one mask that makes this little area better and this makes some other area worse so our evaluation function in this case is just checking oh there now we're stuck got a score of 407 and it was the best that we could do now all of the alternatives are red they're all negative all right so let's throw the stochastic hill climber at it instead uh, uh, all right, so we're starting at some random point now, and the stochastic hill climber makes a, makes a lot more moves because it doesn't need to check all 64 dimensions before deciding what to do. It tries flipping a single dimension, and it's either going to make the score better or it's going to make the score worse. And either way, it considers that, and even if it makes it worse, it might pick it because that's what stochastic hill climbing does. It's biased towards picking the uphill moves, but it accepts downhill moves as well uh, um, and this thing may take a while it, it might not even succeed in any time that we're willing to wait uh, we'll see uh, uh, but this sort of thing uh, a high dimensional problem of relatively coarse dimensions uh oh stochastic hill climbing Looks like there's just one more mask it needs to there it is uh, uh, it solved the problem in this case and yes uh, it's cats we're still on the internet all right that's it